Better can I eat the EPA? Where the can I eat the EPA? Where the can I eat the EPA? Where the can I eat the EPA? The old lady, old lady, old lady, old lady, old lady. Now out in Arizona where the bad men are, the only thing to guide you is the evening star. The roughest, toughest man by far's ragtime cowboy Joe. He got his name from singing to the cattle and sheep. Every night it's said he sings the herd to sleep. In the bass voice, both rich and deep, he's crooning soft and low. He always sings raggedy music to the cattle as he swings. Back and forward in the saddle on the horse. That the syncopated gait, and there is such a funny meter to the roar of his repeater. How they run. The Last Ride of Tex Morton is the story of how Australian country music began on New Zealand's remote coastal town of Nelson and travelled to Sydney, Australia. In this feature documentary, Tex Morton tells in his own words an extraordinary story of a young man's climb from humble beginnings, achieving national and international success, rising through a time of poverty and uncertainty, forging a uniquely Australasian style of music, songs and entertainment. As the first notes of the newborn baby echoed through the sleepy shipping village of Nelson that night, there was a new star created. A star that was to have a world looking at the path that it would blaze into the pages of history. And uh, in the rather remote area of New Zealand, Nelson, where I was born, people who'd come out on the pioneer ships, my own family, my, my, I remember my great granny, they came out on one of the early immigrant ships to New Zealand, bringing with them the, their own folk songs and music. And um, this, these were the songs that influenced me. Born to pioneer stock in the seaside town of Nelson on New Zealand's coast on the 30th of August, 1916. And my father and I both remember, of course, my great granny, who was on one of those immigrant ships. And as an old, old lady, she used to sing me songs of her childhood. Christened Robert William Lane the firstborn to Nelson Postal Clerk, 25-year-old Bernard William and 21-year-old Mildred. We are just plain folks, your mother and me. Just plain folks, like our own folks used to be. The Lane family, a close musically influenced generation with parents and grandparents like families of the time, spent many a night singing the songs of the day. While the old fit was playing there, the soon we'll be swaying to the tune of home sweet home. When I get back again, I'm gonna live to the end in my Blue Ridge Mountain. The Boy Scouts, a childhood interest that was to last a lifetime, introduced the aspiring entertainer to an audience and a love of adventure, achieving the distinction of becoming one of the most awarded scouts in New Zealand. I got into the business when I was a kid. Uh, in fact, I. Uh, I was in the business before I left school. I, I think I earned my entertainer's badge in Boy Scouts. Robert Lane, he attended the prestigious Nelson College, showing more interest in music and theatrics than he did in attending school. And I ran away from home. The old dad found me. The New Zealand police used to bring me back, put, put me back to school. And in those days, boys took notice of the local Bobby when if he said, you go back, your father's looking for you. So I'd go back home and dad would put me back to school, later, college. Tex would play hooky from school learning to play a few guitar chords while listening to the adventures of the sailors while their ships docked in Nelson Harbour. 
Every now and again, I'd meet an American sailor. He would play, he taught me a few little chords, and the Maori boys would teach me a little more fragments of songs. During the depression of the 30s, people were searching for a hero. It was a time when the people desperately needed one. Well, the first shows I, I ever remember taking out on the road were oh, just a few friends. We'd get together and put on concerts. Sometimes we were not paid for it. These were charity shows to raise money for the, for the unemployed during the, during the not-so-good good old days of the, of the Depression. Then I'd be asked to sing around the apple orchards, hop-picking fields around Nelson. I used to, um, I used to appear in uh, community sings, if you remember those. They were popular, usually picked up local artists around Auckland and New Zealand, Jack Davy and I sang on many of those. Here she comes, boys. Be ready to take her on the fly. Hearing the first recordings of a hillbilly singer, later recognized as the father of American country music, inspired and influenced him. Tex developed his own unique Morton guitar and singing style. Of course, Tex Morton, we must admit, he was Australia's superstar, the same as Jimmy Rogers was America's superstar. In the early days, my ambition was to imitate Jimmy Rogers. And I, I had a cross between, I think, Gobel Reeves with his yodeling mm -hmm. and Jimmy Rogers' style and thinking, because I'd been living the same bloody life and it wasn't done purposely. Mm -hmm. I, did, I mean, I didn't go and jump rattlers for fun. I bloody well had to do it. And he gave Australia something to remember him by, to remember Tex Boy. So he, he actually gave us our first introduction to hillbilly or country music. Tex based himself on uh, Jimmy Rogers and um, did a lot of American songs, but he had a style. He could make a, a song be Australian. Um, and uh, he had that sound that I, no one else uh, has got. You could hear Tex and you knew it was Tex. He put a, he put a stamp on it and uh, it was no one else's. It was only Texas. Those early recordings and songs about farming and trains played an influential part in the songwriting and style of the young Tex Morton. I wanted to create a style of my own. I didn't want to be the bloke that copied Jimmy Rogers or copied Carson Robertson. I, I didn't want to imitate anyone. Jimmy Rogers, the singing brakeman, had recorded in 1927 what was to become the first hillbilly classic, Blue Yodel No. 1, T for Texas. Rogers died in 1933 of tuberculosis, an American folk hero. But this new bloke, Jimmy Rogers, had me buggered because I couldn't figure how he got that sound out of his guitar. And Tex Morton wanted to know how Jimmy Rogers done that particular guitar style from chord to chord, a lead into the next chord, and uh, <clears throat> like climbing the ladder type. And he made this run that Jimmy Rogers was popular with. Gil Harris and I used to sit around Nelson there and we used to try and yodel like Harry Tarani mm -hmm. and think like Jimmy Rogers and, 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 and I think my ambition at Nelson College, I didn't want to be Lord Rutherford, I didn't want to bloody split Adams or anything, I didn't want to be the finest surgeon in the world, I wanted to run away from home and be a hobo like Jimmy Rogers. Well Tex Morton based himself on Jimmy Rogers because uh, he always admired Jimmy Rogers and particularly Jimmy Rogers' guitar style. Oh hallelujah, I'm a bum, hallelujah, bum again. Oh hallelujah, give us a hand out to revive us again. <laughs> you know that one, don't you? Most people had never seen the guitar the way we play it these days. In the old days, the, the, the only used to have the slide guitars, the Hawaiian. In those days, they used to play it on the knee, the, what we used to call Hawaiian style or steel guitar style. And then when Tex came out, he's holding it up against his chest, playing it. That, that was a bit different. That was up the Spanish guitar. Great guitar player. He always had those doo -doo 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 -doo. and it was very in-your-face sort of guitar playing. So it always sounded good. And and I noticed when a Tex Morton song came on the radio, and I heard hundreds of them. I think you'd always know it was a Tex song by the intro, the guitar. You know, it was so so outstanding. Because people say to me, who, who did I idolise or base my style on? And, and there was only the two people. There was the father of country music, Jimmy Rogers in America, and Tex Morton. The, the, the way Tex played the guitar and the way I do it, the, the, the guitar becomes your orchestra. 
You had a certain style, a pick and strum, and you, and you, and you dampen it down when you're doing, you're doing your chorus, your verses, and you now I've got it off pat. The young Tex, an ardent Jimmy Rogers fan, had been performing in New Zealand at community halls, but the small town applause wasn't enough, and within a short time he was boarding the RMS Monoway with a one-way ticket to Sydney, Australia, a suitcase full of hillbilly records and trusty guitar in hand. We travel the road together, leading to lands afar, singing in all kinds of weather and strumming my old guitar. Here we go, just we three, oh how happy we will be. I'll hitch my wagon to a silver star and climb with you and my old guitar. Entering Sydney Harbour in 1934 with Robert Lane was a fellow New Zealander who would become one of Australia's biggest radio stars, the voice of movie newsreels, the king of quiz shows. Individually, they would create Australian entertainment history. When Tex Morton moved to Australia from New Zealand, he came with another uh, legend in, um, I'd say, probably variety entertainment. It was uh, Jack Davey, who um, had... Uh, you know, all the great television, uh, radio shows, and then went into television and died at a very young age. So those two uh, legends came to Australia from New Zealand together on the same ship. As the bow of the Monoway cut a path through an endless flow of white-capped waves steaming towards Sydney, Australia, Jack Davey started calling Robert Lane Tex, a name that was to stick with him for life. Jack Davey used to call me, and John Harper, a few of those fellows around Sydney used to call me Tex in a joking manner, and, and the name stuck. Always, you had this ambition to get away somewhere and try and find a job or see the world. Well, I finally made it over to Australia. When Tex arrived here in Australia from Nelson, New Zealand, um, there was no country music around. Tex was the man who started it all. In Sydney, Tex found things much the same as New Zealand. Tough times, no work, and to survive had to go street singing, busking and living on handouts. Disillusioned and with guitar in hand, he headed out bush looking for work. Around. The girls are pretty as I very soon found It's a real nice place should you ever go down But they don't waste much of a sheep downtown So I took off and for the bush and worked around Australia and doing all sorts of bushwork, anything A few days painting sheds, cutting hedges, mowing lawns, bit of droving, anything Tex lived a bum's life, jumping the rattlers, doing odd jobs, busking in Queensland's remote outback while learning the yarns of the bush. After a while, armed with a swag full of poems, stories and songs collected about Australia, Tex returned once again to Sydney. I, said, oh, I, I read a lot of those bush songs after I came back from the bush because I happened to be living up the cross. And I think when I was living up there, it was about the only time I had any spare time to do any writing. There was one thing he did tell me, because I was writing songs, he said, uh, he gave me a clue, he said, don't paint the full picture when you're writing a song. He said, always leave it, if you can, for the public to imagine or make their own interpretation of what you're saying. He said, instead of saying, uh, describing a street, describe something in the street and they'll use that to... Uh, give a different interpretation of what you're saying. He said, never try to be too explicit in your songwriting. And if you listen close to a lot of texts, he's, it's not what he says in the song, it's what he doesn't say. I took a job at Neons as a, an all-rounder, a bit of a rigger and a painter, spray painter, electrician. The first job I remember they sent me on, I might have exaggerated a little bit to get the job, I was terrified, it was to go and maintain the light in the middle of Sydney Harbour Bridge on a stormy night. And I stayed in that job until, uh, until I was able to go into show business full time. Tex started crafting together the stories gathered in the outback, working by day and singing by night. At the same time, a Bakelite box called a wireless had families in Australia and New Zealand fascinated by the sounds and mesmerised by the faint yellow glow of the dial. 
Not even Tex could predict the role his music would play in the growth and popularity of radio. During all this time, a, radio was the best thing out for, uh, for talent. They had a lot of talent press on several radio stations. 2KY, a commercial station in Sydney, announced that they would hold the greatest amateur trial to beat all amateur trials ever held in Australia. I, I, I won novelty vocalist or whatever it was. And uh, I can always remember being so amazed, it bowled me over the reaction. In the big rough candy mountain, you never change your socks. And the little old streams of alcohol come trickling down the rocks. All the brakemen have to tip their hats and the railroad bulls are flying. There's a lake of stew and a whiskey too. You can paddle all around them in the big canoe in the big rough candy mountain. My first recollections of the country music singers were strongly uh, flavoured by particularly Tex Morton. Uh, I would be very interested each time he would come through with his show, uh, he would perform on the local radio station. And I used to sing on this 2KY on a Sunday night program run by a local music shop. And Tex was singing to a lot of highbrow people. They were in their white tux and everything, black tux and white shirts. And he sang a couple of his songs and yodeled and the people really brought the house down almost. And he said, well, thank you very much. He said, I'm just so grateful that you really appreciate fine music. But at the same time, I was starting to get known on the ABC. I was appearing with Jim Davidson, the dance band. And one was the ABC, the other was the British and the other one was the working man's friend. This is Tech A.Y., shouldn't it? You know, two opposite ends of the stick. And uh, to hear him singing live and playing that big old guitar, uh, it was so raw and so good that it was so different to his records that it really intrigued me. Now singing his own songs of Australiana, Tex Morton started to attract a following in Sydney and the attention of the media, among them poet and storyteller Banjo Patterson. You fellas keep telling me I pioneered it here in this country. I, I, I assure you I didn't uh, intend it that way. I didn't set out to make waves. I, it all happened by accident. I was a kid singing around the streets, uh, looking for work, working odd jobs, anything wandering around the country, collecting poems and songs, and I would say the turning point in my life would be the Jimmy Rogers records, and when I met old man Joe Patterson, and he's the one who gave me encouragement, he said, you keep at it, boy, he said, and uh, what with all this newfangled recording devices they have nowadays, you can put it down, you can record it, which I couldn't do, and he shook my hand outside Randwick Racecourse down there in Sydney. I, uh first met um, young Tex Morton. At a party one night in about 1939, I asked old Mr. A.B. Patterson, Banjo Patterson. He'd be recording my work, so uh, putting them into a tune, and quite wonderful tunes. And uh, I always remember that because I had the temerity. I'd just started my ABC broadcasts, my Bush poetry sessions then, mm -hmm. and I, I suppose I'd had a couple of drinks, and uh, I was brash enough and cocky enough to ask old Banjo if, if he really wrote waltzing Matilda, and I'll never forget his answer. It was the perfect squelch. He put his hand on my shoulder and he said, Let's just say I collected it. Sonny. <laughs> <laughs> he put me down to sixpence. But he was the one who gave me the idea of collecting the stuff. And he said, You should, in your travels, collect these half-forgotten fragments of Australiana. If he'd never sung a note, he could have been famous just for reciting Australian ballads. Waltzing Matilda Waltzing Matilda You'll come a-waltzing Matilda with me And he sang as he watched and waited while his billy boy You'll come a-waltzing Matilda with me And old, old Patterson, he said, I used to call him Mr. Patterson and uh, later I was one of the very few who was asked to call him Butt. Butt, that was his name, he liked that. And he used to hear my wireless programs and I used to ask his permission to uh, recite his poetry on ABC and sing a few little folk songs. Not necessarily what we today call country music. Some of them were sea shanties, some were hobo songs. I, uh, then I started to write a few Australian songs a lot of American stuff, and a few of old banjos, and a few of Henry Lawson, C.J. Dennis, some of Service, Kipling, etc. But from there, I started to feel, people used to write in, send me smattering, send me fragments of half-forgotten songs, 
in exercise books, on toilet paper. And I put them all together, made a collection, and <clears throat> that's actually how it started. Hex, I've got a letter here for you. Plum forgot all about it till we started to sing that there song about home. I oh. suppose it's from your mall. That's mighty funny, Slim. Thank you very much. <clears throat> oh, say, this here's from one of my fans. <laughs> What's wrong with the other one? Sick or something? No, 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 no. I'll listen on the level now. Dear Mr. Morton, I like your singing so much, I have decided to write you this letter and send you some for your throat. <laughs> Gee, now, ain't that mighty fine of him, oh, eh? Go on, go on. Read the rest of it. Uh, where was I now? Uh, so please find and close two razor blades. <laughs> oh, gee, say. I first heard a Tex Morton uh, songs when uh, I was growing up, uh, and my dad would uh, sit around the fireplace and sing these old songs, and even at a young age, I'd always say, Dad, whose song's that, you know? Where'd that song come from? And it was always Tex Morton. And uh, my dad even used to try and sound like Tex, you know? He'd sort of sing through his nose like that a little. And uh, I always knew when it was a Tex Morton song because he'd, he'd done the nose thing, you know? And it was, uh, it, was, it was funny, but it was a great, great influence. I used to hear him on the radio on uh, Sunset Trail, which used to be on uh, 2WL Wollongong. From that day on, I knew that I was going to be a country music entertainer and performer. When you're interviewing Tex Morton on air, I was a broadcaster, he would ring from anywhere at all. And you didn't have time to fiddle around with seven second time delays. Uh, and I would just go into an interview and take it as it came. And Tex, with that devilish way that he had, would know that he was on air and he would swear and then apologize and say that, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't know I was on air. All the time he did know. <laughs> of course, I had to somehow explain it to management the next day, but we got away with it. But that was Tex Morton. You, you took him as you found him. I finally was able to bring it about so that after having sung it a few times and created a demand for it, I would then be able to persuade the recording company to include that in the next recording session. And that's what caused the uh, tremendous upsurge of sales in that type of music at that time because we must remember I was the only one in Australia doing it and um, I had the market all to myself. His master's voice, built and guaranteed by the Australian branch of the greatest radio manufacturing organisation in the British Empire. And uh, I think I started to make my first records here in Australia about 1935 or six. Tex first recorded in uh, Homebush in Sydney in 1936 for the Regal Zonophone label. Regal Zonophone sold the popular 78s of the day at just two shillings and sixpence. The label successfully launched the careers of many Australian performers. I did record, I think, during my first four songs for the old Regal Zonophone label. Uh, I, I think two of the four were of my own composition, songs I'd written. 1936, the 25th of February, Tex entered the Regal Zonophone Studios in Homebush, Sydney, Australia. This historic recording session produced four tracks, Texas in the Spring, Going Back to Texas, The Happy Yodler and The Swiss Sweetheart, with Tex providing guitar accompaniment. My yodeling sweetheart, it's you that I call, yeah, lady. About that time, I had uh, gone out to see this chap, Tyler, I think was his name, Tim Tyler, who ran the show then, and uh, cut the first records. Well, then I went away again, I was busking again. But uh, when Tex first recorded for Regal's on the phone, he was, uh, he took a flat payment for his first session, three quid or something like that. Well, I made my first records for a flat fee. I'd made the records and forgotten all about them. Had my picture on a couple of issues of sheet music at that time and that was about as far as I thought I'd ever get. I didn't know that the records were successful until he was in New Zealand. So uh, when I got near to Nelson I found that I was once again broke and so I pulled out the old guitar and once again I went street singing. He's walking past the shop and here's a, a big cut out photo. And I looked at him and I thought he's a lucky bloke, he's a big recording star. And in six inch letters across the bottom it said the uh, sensational singing cowboy, Tex Morton. And here I was singing outside the record shop trying to get my fare down to Nelson. 
The release of the first Morton 78 records took Australia and New Zealand by storm. Tex Morton was now becoming by far and wide our most popular recording star. I remember being told by one of the executives at the record company that my records were outselling all the other artists combined here in Australia and I couldn't believe it. At the time, he was undoubtedly the number one hillbilly country and western superstar, with success at a level not equaled even by today's country entertainers. Uh, over the years, he had many, many records, and I guess if they had been giving out gold records then, uh, Tex would have had a garage full of them. I remember I was talking to him one time on radio, and he said, uh, I asked him, did he ever get a gold record? And he said, well, I've never really followed them. He said, I suppose I'm entitled to one or two, but... Uh, that would be the understatement of the year because Tex told me, and it was substantiated later, that at one time his records were outselling all the artists in the world here in Australia. Sounds crazy, but it's right. And the record, The Black Sheep, it sold over 80,000 copies. And if you think about that, at the time when that was released, the Australian population was only about six million people as compared to what it is now and what records you have to sell to get a gold record. So Tex was certainly entitled to uh, gold records which he never received. Well I think the, uh, <clears throat> the main request for this week is a very old number. One of the first songs I think I ever sang on the Australian radio, the old Black Sheep. The Black Sheep. Uh, particularly the Black Sheep, that was my favourite because uh, uh, it was a story that I fully understood, even at f f five or six years old, I understood what the whole thing meant, you know. And I find the black sheep loves his dad far better than the rest. Black sheep was a morbid bloody thing. The old man loves his dad, thrown in jail over the hill to the poorhouse. Uh, it seems that they're big sellers. Old Shep is certainly the most requested song I've ever sung. Old Shep, even though it was an American song, Tex made it his own, and he's very well known for that song. Probably the best selling or the first big selling record I ever had. I didn't write it. I recorded it about 1940 with Sister Dory. In my humble opinion, one of the prettiest songs, Old Red Foley's wonderful Old Shep. was a pup over hills and meadows we'd stray just a boy and his dog we were both full of fun we grew up together that way you know i think he uh, he definitely was our and still is our has been our greatest uh, outdoor showman Pity the showman, the poor traveling showman. I've traveled with the skew bobs, so I've had lots of tries. I seem to hear young Lance again as he'd get up and cry. The showman is the thing about old Tex, and uh. And I guess that's one way I relate to text sometimes more often than some of the, a lot of the others because uh, because that was his I think he, his big thing was being an entertainer more so to me than a than a singer like he eventually went into acting as well he's, he's a bit of a jack of all trades and he, I think that's uh, the entertainer coming out promoting it as the greatest rodeo variety circus show ever seen in Australia the show toured coast to coast with the Gill Brothers, Ashton's Family Circus, the Holden Brothers and friend and business partners the Skewthorps. We went to these small towns and oh everywhere I went you couldn't get, couldn't get in so we used to clean up a fortune of course and that's the story of how we started on the on the rodeos. I started on the showgrounds and within six months, I, within a year I had the biggest show in Australia and we were chasing big shows like Worth's and they used to jump on us at first and 
squash me, but once we got going and I got good people with me, we were able to chase them and we became the biggest show in the country. And then he was very good. He came back into Saiju Alley and he went round the joints and brought crowds to... Uh, he, he was shooting and uh, throwing and that sort of thing. So he, he used to work in with the show people, the show is very well. I think Morton was probably the greatest, inverted commas, showman of them all. Um, Buddy Williams, Shirley Toms, Smokey, magnificent in what they did. But there was a certain something in what Morton did that shone above all the rest. Why that was, who knows? It was just, it was just in the man. And then I took out my own shows on side show, on uh, showgrounds. I had buck jumping shows and I'd always get up and sing a song among the other acts, the rope spinners, the whip crackers, the sharpshooters and so on. That was a 1943. Yes, around about mid-1943 because I remember it well. I just got discharged from the army and I had more time to go around. And I used to see Tex at some of his travelling shows. He'd go and watch him doing his sharpshooting and whip cracking. first time I met Tex, it was in uh, Moss Vale. I was only a young chap. I was, possibly, I was still going to primary school, actually. And I tried to uh, sneak in under the tent. I didn't have any money. I wanted to get in and see Aristocrat was appearing on the Mossvale showground that time. The next thing, I got a boot up the arse and a big deep boy said, if you're going in, boy, get in, bang. And I was in under the tent. That was the first introduction I ever had to Tex Morton. I had the Gills family, very, very fine family of rough riders with me, very versatile people, clowns, acrobats, fine rough riders, all of them and uh, sharpshooters with crackers and so on. And then when they broke away and reformed their own show, uh, then I had the Ashtons, the Ashton Circus today. And they were a good family show, and we toured Australia again. And, and the show became the biggest of its kind ever seen in Australia. Well, I think the, uh, the first time I do remember meeting Tex, I was with uh, a mate of mine, Shorty Ranger. We were just kids at Kempsey. We came down for the Kempsey show, and uh, I was about 11. And Tex was with the Skewthorps and uh, and the, the Gills. I think they're all all working together. It was mainly the old the old Skewthorpe show. So Tex arrived at the showgrounds, and being typical Tex, he drove straight down the midway or the uh, sideshow alley, blocked all the traffic and people and people everywhere. So Shorty and I fronted up, and uh, being bush kids, we had a funny way of expressing things sometimes. If we thought somebody was a bit smart, we'd say, "Well, she th she thinks he's smart," or something like that. So. <laughs> So I, I boldly walked up to the car, Tex was there in his sombre era and very, very smartly dressed. And I, I looked at Shorty, I said, I think, she's a, I think she's a bit stuck up. And he looked up and he said, do you think so, son? Frightened hell out of me. <laughs> I actually uh, got to see Tex Morton when I was only a kid. Um, my dad took me to the circus and Tex was travelling with the circus at that stage. And he was uh, cracking whips and sharp shooting. And the things he did with a rifle was just incredible. <laughs> I don't know if there were any tricks involved or what. I know he was a real showman, but uh, and he sang a couple of songs, but it was mainly all these uh, tr tricks with a stock whip and, and sharp shooting that he was doing. And he had a couple of girls there, if I can remember rightly, sort of in the act. And uh, it was quite an act. And uh, I didn't realise at the time what I was witnessing, you know, that it was the great Tex Morton, because I was sort of too young to realise the impact of that at that age. But thinking back on it, I'm glad I was there. Gradually, as the, as the years went along, I, I formed a pretty big show with Australia's very first country western band. At the time, they were unheard of. George Raymond, or George Reed on fiddle, Dory playing accordion, Sister Dory, and myself, and Dick Carr. Dick, I think, uh, later had the buckaroos. Tex formed the Rough Riders, using them as a backing band on recordings and with the Travelling Variety Circus Show. On vocals and accordion, Australia's first female country recording artist, Sister Dory. About 40, about 37, I came through here with the Tivoli's and Dory was in the same show and she and I used to sing duets. Dorothy May Ricketts, born in the small town of Warrigal, Victoria in 1910, had been a respected vaudeville performer on the Tivoli circuit before joining Tex Morton and touring with the Country and Western show as Sister Dory. Um, and uh, I happened to be walking down the street one day and I saw this big Buick with Tex Morton number two car written on it, you know. And um, anyway, I waited around for a while and Tex came along. Tex said to me, he said, uh, have you ever thought about doing any country music, Dory, you know, just country music? And he said, would you like to join the show? He said, uh, I'm putting a band together, a Rough Riders band. 
Oh, I said, that'd be wonderful. And then I joined Texas Joe and stayed with him for all those years. Tex and Sister Dory had an instant appeal on stage, radio and record, with the song Slipping Around becoming a number one hit. Then I won't have to slip around to have your company. We invited Sister Dory to come to Tamworth for the Hands of Fame to place her hand in the cement. And while she was here, we asked her some of the stories, reminiscences of her days at the, on the Tex Morton show. And one time they were travelling between towns and Tex and his offsider stopped at a, at a hotel to have a drink. And they had horses in a van parked outside and Dory was with them and she thought these poor horses, they need a break too. So she got the horses out of the van and started to walk them along the road. When she was about a kilometre out of town, along came Tex and the other fellow, drove straight past, tooted the horn, kept on going, all the way to the next town. Dory was horrified. She said, that was just like Tex, he'd do that to you. And he knew that I wouldn't abandon the horses, so she had to walk all the way to the next, to the next town with these horses. And he never, never mentioned it, never apologised, never said a word. But she said, that's Tex. Aged 82, Sister Dory passed away quietly in 1992, leaving behind a legacy of country music. Dory had respectfully earned the title of the First Lady of Country and Western, a pioneer and trailblazer for women in Australian country music. Tex Morton, through the Hawaiian Club, set up the first mail-order guitars and lesson books, selling thousands to young Morton fans all over Australia and New Zealand. You could also order Morton Music songbooks, Tex Morton clothing, and join the Tex Morton fan club. Well, I Tex used the Hawaiian Club as his base and for his, uh, for his box office mail. Then it turned out the Hawaiian Club realised uh, they needed someone to teach the hillbilly guitar to sell the Tex Morton guitars. And uh, it was Tex Morton's name they were using actually, because the Hawaiian Club made the guitars. And uh, so uh, they suggested I teach the hillbilly guitar to help sell the Tex Morton guitars. So I said, well, if I teach, I said, I'd sooner teach it my way, a quick way, to make them learn quick, and then I'll tell their friends and they'll go and buy more guitars. Tex influenced me so much that when I saw an ad in a little newspaper about a Tex Morton mail order guitar, I was quick to save up my money by trapping rabbits and selling the skins. And uh, I think it was only about 12 pounds I had to send away. A little coupon I filled in and I said, send it by train. So I, uh, I uh, rode my little bike up to Kentucky and there sure enough, there was the guitar that Tex had sent. Uh, I suppose Tex had people doing this for him, but to me it was direct from Tex Morton. That's what made Tex Morton so pleased that I was able to teach him so quick because I was selling more guitars. So from then on, I got to know Tex more and more. She'll be coming round the mountain when she comes, when she comes. She'll be coming round the mountain, coming round the mountain. Say she'll be coming round the mountain when she comes. Right, hubby! Tex said to me one day, he says, uh, uh, we've got to close, or not we, says the Hawaiian Club's got to get out of these premises. says, why not try and keep this club going? He says, you haven't got a club here, but you've got the gathering here to form a club. He says, it's a shame to see it close, and all those might drift away, and no one to encourage them like you have done. So he, he says, I suggest you start a hillbilly club. Uh, have a good talk to them up there, form a committee, and get a hillbilly club going. And he said to me, I'll never forget that, Tex, if you get this club going, keep, educate the young ones, push the young ones on, and any new talent, give them encouragement. Uh, Tex influenced first people like Buddy Williams, then Gordon Parsons, and Dusty Rankin, and then a young lad from Nulla Nulla Creek who went on to do wonderful things with it, who called himself Slim Dusty. Well, it's a funny thing, a lot of people really don't know, but I, uh, I was only a kid of about 15 or 16, and, uh, and, I, and I went to Sydney, and, and I'd been pounding the one and only record company, the Columbia Gramophone Company, 
in uh, Homebush, on Parramatta Road, and uh, I couldn't get on record, but you could make your own record, pay for it, a process record. So I had this one record out, and my, my cousin was out at Maxwell Way, and he, he got uh, friendly with Tex and the mob. So when they arrived in Kempsey, I was introduced to Tex, and uh, he, he played my record that night at the show. So anyway, for about a week then, we stayed with him, and I, I performed in the show. Uh, Kempsey, there was Coffs Harbour, Port Macquarie, and uh, that was a pretty good time because being backstage with Tex, we, uh, the clown got into trouble with the police, he was drunk and he was drunk up the street and caused some disturbance so they got him back behind the tent, put the clown suit on him and the police couldn't find him. <laughs> I said, Jesus, this is what show business is all about, but it was very good. Sing in the street if you have to, sing on circuses, carnivals, anywhere, gain experience. If you have talent, it'll show through eventually. It, it, may seem, it may not seem that way for a while, but if you've got talent, uh, you'll come to the top. And then Tex, in his, in his moments, he'd talk to you. And uh, he, once he said to me, you know, if you continue with this uh, in this field, he said, always remember that he said, you must be friendly to your fans and, always, and be approachable, but, but always be that little bit aloof, just a little bit aloof. And he said, uh, if you, anyone asks you to perform and you're stuck somewhere, he said, find a box or a platform or anything, always be those few inches above them. When you walk on stage, you are in command. And I stayed a fan of Texas right up until this very present day. I'm still a great fan of Texas. I love to hear his old records and, the, and just the way he, uh, he had command of everything that he did. And he said, when you walk on stage, give them the impression that you're in command. And boy, oh boy, did he do that. So that, that was great advice for a kid of about 15, 16. Wrap me up with my stock whip and blanket Bury me deep down below In 1946, Tex stopped recording after a disagreement with Regal Zonophone's Arch Kerr. It has been read, uh, said and written that I was a hard man to work with. It was generally conceded by all that knew me that I could get more out of musicians than anybody else. To many fans and music historians, Kerr is responsible even to this day for causing Morton to stop writing and recording while at the top of his singing and songwriting peak. He wanted to uh, use a band. He used Dick Carr and uh, George Raymond on fiddle. Dory, Sister Dory on the squeeze box, was, that was the basic band. And he wanted to uh, increased the band towards the end of his recording career with Regal's on a phone, but Arch Kerr wanted Tex to revert back to single guitar backing, and Tex told Arch Kerr what he could do with his records, and completely stopped recording for Regal's on a phone. That's how I come to leave the company, as a matter of fact. They, they had a fellow here, this Arch Kerr. Uh, I used to want to sing the songs that I'd collected around Australia and sing more of them. And I had formed, this is when I had the big radio and circus going, and I had, by this time I had the Rough Riders band. And they were all good, they were the best available at the time. And I used to predict, I'd say, the, the people will get tired of just guitar and voice. They said, no, it's too expensive for your sessions. I said, right, well, I bloody will pay for it. And I used to bring these people all the way down from Queensland to cut a recording session in my own car. It was Dory, Dick Carr, and uh, other odd bods. And we'd, I'd bring them all down, pay their wages, put them on the session, but in those days, I could see then that there was coming a time when we'd, we'd have to put bands with it to sell the stuff. But Arch Kerr only ever recorded the, the hillbilly with his guitar, and he used to say that's because that's what people wanted to hear. Tex had his own band, the Rough Riders, and he just brought them into the studio and said, I'm recording with a band. And Arch Kerr said, well, well, we don't need a band. He said, I do. Other blokes in Regal's on a phone told Arch Kerr that Tex Morton's in town and Arch Kerr's attitude was, oh well, Tex knows where we are and Tex knew where he was and avoided him. He refused to go and record any more for Regal Zonathan. Then along came Buddy Williams and in a conversation in later years with Mr Arch Kerr, who was the, the repertoire director of uh, HMV, he said that he recognised, he, he saw in Buddy an opportunity to get some rivalry with Tex Morton. The walkout by Tex from Regal's Onophone had been predicted by Arch Kerr, who had already signed to the label a singer who would go on to achieve success in his own right, Buddy Williams. The thing is that uh, 
When I heard Buddy sing, I thought to myself, now this is the bloke I'm looking for because Tex Morton was the only one recording at that time country music. And uh, Tex was erratic and unreliable and all that sort of thing. And I thought to myself, well now if this chap walks out, well we've got nobody. And I've got to have a backstop for him. And it wasn't very long before I realised that uh, that uh, Buddy was a, was a potential uh, replacement for Tex. Funny thing, him and Buddy, Buddy would not come to the club while Tex was here. And I don't think Tex would come to the club if Buddy was here. It was just a, we thought it was a bit of a joke, you know. Tex and Buddy are gone, but the legend lives on. Their songs take me back through the years. When a man and his guitar could hang a dream upon a star Tex and Buddy were the pioneers HMV were keen to get him back into the studio Tex being Tex couldn't care less uh, he just uh, roamed the country doing what he wanted to do I know I got so busy then I was running the radio and circus and I just didn't care about the records because it wasn't pleasant Free from Regal Zonophone, Tex was now looking to new adventures and was approached in Australia by the legendary American hillbilly producer from OK Records, Ralph Peer. Well, about 1948, Ralph Peer, Mr. Ralph Peer, came down to Australia. He had, uh, he told me, heard about uh, the way my records were selling and uh, he wanted to meet me and I, I had heard of him, of course. I knew of him as the man who had well, I think I can say pioneered country western music. He'd been recording, seeking out country music all over America and bringing it to the cities over there since 1921. About this time, I, I felt that I'd achieved everything I could do here. I mean, I had my song albums going and I'd made dozens and dozens of records and, oh, I wanted to break away from it. He uh, asked me if I'd be interested in, in coming to America, or signing up with him. Well, I jumped at the chance. Under Ralph Peer's management in the United States, Tex stayed at the palatial Peer Mansion, lived the life of a star, meeting and working with America's favorite country artists and Hollywood stars of the time. So I went over and toured New Zealand and saw my parents and uh, closed the circus here, stored most of the gear and, uh, and took off and, uh, and landed up in Los Angeles. I stopped over in Hawaii for a while. And uh, to my surprise, old Gene Autry came out to the airport to meet me. And he told me about his great meetings with uh, Gene Autry. And uh, things that, uh, Gene was apparently showing him through and around Hollywood. He was a pretty good friend of mine. But Autry knows a lot more about folk and early country and western than most folk give him, most folk give him credit for. He's a very knowledgeable bloke. And I believe he was a very good friend of uh, Gene Autry's. Uh, we got to meet Gene Autry in later years and uh, asked him about Tex and he said, sure, I remember Tex Morton came over from Australia. He was a wild man. In America, he would create a blaze of publicity generated by a headline-grabbing Morton stunt. One of my stunts is to walk blindfolded around the, the top of the largest building in a, in a town and uh, I did it in Vancouver. But the stunt went over very well there because the photographer who was supposed to photograph me uh, painted on the rooftop, and the other photographer from the opposition newspaper got a lovely <laughs> picture of him stretched out on the uh, on the on the roof. <laughs> He'd go go in, into an ex, in, intersection and purposely stall the car. And we said, can't get the bloody thing started. Cars to was Tex Morton all over the car. Police have got to come. What, what's wrong with it? And it's getting publicity. <laughs> oh, born shame. And uh, things must have been a little bit quiet. And Tex wanted some publicity, so he he pulled out a gun and. Uh, out the window where they were staying in the hotel and shot out a few lights in the street and that sure got him some attention. In the States, Tex appeared on the popular radio shows of the time and was one of the first country artists to appear on the new medium television. America had started to notice Australia's country singing sensation. I visited all the big radio programs, television programs, guested on a lot of them, right from Tex Ritter to Steve Allen, Ed Sullivan, the Grand Old Opry Show. 
he told me about some of the events that happened in the States and he gave me a souvenir program of one of his shows, I think it was in Montreal, and it showed Tex, the big banners of the Tex Morton show, and people queued up right round the block. He was the highest priced act in the country at that time. Nobody was getting more money. And, uh, I mean, you know, he was earning something like 5,000 pounds a week or something, or a show. It was a ridiculous amount of money for, for that time. And he went up into the uh, Alaska, beyond Alaska, with another one-man show, flying in and out of the little mining camps. And uh, he told me he made his some movies over there in those locations. I was the first professional entertainer ever to go into the territories. I fly into all these camps. I was in 45 below zero weather in Uranium City up around uh, in the north, north of Saskatchewan. And we made a movie up there, as a matter of fact. Uh, I portrayed a, a heavy drinking, rowdy, dashing bush pilot. Poor had everything he knew to do to keep the cat away. He sent him up to Canada and told him for to stay, but the cat came back. The very next day the old cat came back. They thought he was a goner, but the cat came back. He wouldn't stay away. He went on to, uh, to travel America. He recorded and probably worked without permits. Tex was also being noticed by the U.S. immigration officials. He had overstayed his welcome and his work visa. Undaunted, Morton set up camp in Canada. He got kicked out into Canada, I had to run off into Canada, uh, became Dr. Robert Morton, the uh, hypnotist, and uh, did a good job at that, I believe. And uh, for five years, I worked out of Montreal. In Montreal, Canada, he studied and completed a thesis at the Institute of Hypnotherapy gaining a degree in hypnosis, graduating as Dr. Morton. Did several cross-country lectures and uh, at various universities and institutions there and uh, took my degrees. I wrote a thesis, strangely enough, on the use of hypnosis by primitive peoples and uh, included in this the, uh, the stories of the Australian Aborigines, the oldest people on the face of the earth. Then from time to time I gave demonstrations of hypnotism at the various colleges and universities such as McGill University in Montreal where I lectured for some time. Then I went into practice. I opened with an associate the Institute of Hypnotherapy in Toronto. From time to time I made tours back in show business. Uh, I gave them a shooting demonstration for the Mounties on several occasions and uh, then I would be asked to appear on television singing and uh, all in all, I became known as an all-round entertainer and lecturer. So I was approached by the leading theater groups up there to put on the whole show as a hodgepodge, as a one-man variety show. And much to my surprise, it went over very, very successfully. Uh, in some of those clippings, they refer to me as Dr. Morton, but of course, I don't think it's in good taste to use that. I, I'm still known as old Tex Morton, and uh, that is how I advertise myself. They do call me in Canada the, the Great Morton. Uh, it wasn't my idea, that was the press publicity man's idea, and they bill it as the Great Morton Show. It went on for 20 weeks, the show, a one-man show, and people, five days, five shows a day, pardon me, and it was just a one-man show with hypnotism, uh, music, a little bit of guitar playing, and uh, poetry reading. Tex Morton put together his amazing one-man show, a two-and-a-half-hour program of sharpshooting, singing, recitals, whip-cracking and hypnotism. The show, the first of its kind, had audiences lined up in below zero temperatures, eager to see the great Morton on stage. I worked and presented shows uh, all over Europe and here in Australia, and I've been up in the Philippines and Hong Kong and Japan and Taipei all through that area. Uh, in Hong Kong, I presented demonstrations of hypnotism, memory training, etc. The 1950s. Tex was attracting large crowds and earning a huge amount of money for his one-man shows. He had homes in New York, Los Angeles, Tennessee and Montreal. As the Great Morton, he toured for over a decade to all corners of the world. The late, great Hank Williams, uh, I had him on the road for a while and uh, and the uh, Three Foot Five and Roy Acuff I mentioned earlier. We had all these boys touring with the show from time to time. 
took them all over Canada and all over the States, down as far as Jamaica, Mexico. I've known the truth for such a long time now, longer than you'd ever guess. In Hollywood, Tex operated a licensed management office, was a member of the Screen Actors Guild, appeared on stage in productions in Montreal and the Pasadena Playhouse, playing Teddy Roosevelt in Arsenic and Old Lace. He acted in the Lux TV Playhouse, Circus Boy, Annie Oakley, Gunsmoke, and appeared in several of the popular Gene Autry shows. Come round and listen, all you boys who think that you can ride. I got a horse in here that always throws them high and wide. Bring your knee pad saddles, I'll give a ten a flat. If you can stay ten seconds on my horse, aristocrat. When I came back from overseas, um, Slim was beginning to uh, just... The, the crest of the wave had gone on pub with no beer. That's what brought him to attention. It, it was one of those things, Tex Morton was always there, whether, I mean, he went to America for 12 years, and in that 12 years, I, I came up, had the pub and the beer, and got, got established. But in the back of your mind, Tex Morton was always there. Oh, I've been a wild rover this many a year, and I spent all my money on whiskey and beer. But now I'm returning with gold in great store, and I never shall play the wild rover no more. And, uh, you know, I couldn't help getting the feeling that this man was torn. He was torn two ways. Um, as you know, he'd, he'd gone over to the States to make his fame and fortune and had finally come back to Australia. And he was always, oh, I'm going to do this and I'm going to do that and I'm going to do the other thing. And uh, some of it he did. But he never really took on in the recording field took on Slim Dusty. Now by the time Tex got back to Australia, Slim had become the king. And Tex Morton, this is my assessment only, Tex Morton would be second fiddle to nobody. And I think Tex was really not game to try and assume the mantle of number one because he thought he might not be able to do it. He'd been away too long. The beginning of the 60s brought Tex Morton, the yodeling boundary rider, back to Australia, touring with him the pioneer of the Nashville Grand Ole Opry, Roy Acuff. The show, the first of its kind down under, saw the return of Tex Morton, performing to his Australian fans after an absence of over 10 years. I was at the Grand Ole Opry for some time, and as a matter of fact, that's how I came back here. I brought down a, a very fine country western group, Roy Acuff. And Roy has been up, always been known up there for donkey's ages. And I brought him down to the Sydney Stadium, took him into Adelaide, and then he made some television shorts in Sydney and went back on home to the States, to Nashville, Tennessee. It's my pleasure now to introduce a man whose name is spoken with respect and admiration all over the world, wherever people who like country and western music foregather. I am speaking, of course, of Mr. Country Music himself, Roy Acuff and the Smoky Mountain Boy. Thank you very much, Tex Morton. May I say that it's a real pleasure and a privilege to have the opportunity to come to Sydney, Australia. Not long after he did the uh, ACUF show, Tex went round Australia, asked Roy ACUF where Tex was. He said, oh, the bastard's running around Australia in a car without petrol. <laughs> <laughs> they weren't real happy about Tex because Tex got a better hand at the stadium than Roy Acuff. <laughs> now look, before we start, I fully realize the fact that a lot of people do not like yodeling. But I don't think that matters much. We have your money, so you've got to sit there and listen, whether you like it or not. <laughs> this is what is known as the Australian style of yodeling. It's a little different. And if you have any small children with you, hold on to them, because I'm going to scare the hell out of them. Tex went right round Australia with a little one-man show. He later on took Ethel McCoy round, and the two of them travelled like a nostalgia trip back to the uh, towns and cities that Tex had been through in the late 30s and 40s. The Morton Country Variety Show was put together as the Mortons and McCoys, 
the show would revisit the towns and communities that hadn't seen a Tex Morton performance in over 20 years. The show was a success, but by now the times had changed in country Australia. I had the pleasure of uh, touring with Athel McCoy, and Athel McCoy and Tex were great mates. They had a show called The Mortons and McCoys. A funny little thing, we were at a place called Salmon Gums in um, Western Australia. And we used to do the first part of the show and uh, then Tex would do the second part. And Athel was a great comp here. He'd come out and he'd say, uh, welcome to the Mortons and McCoys and uh, we'll have the great Tex Morton on after interval. And this particular night, interval came and there was no sign of Tex. He got uh, waylaid and then uh, when interval was over, we had to go back out again and next thing Tex came down the side and Athel came out and said, um, Tex uh, is here, uh, he's been called away to an urgent phone call and uh, here he is, the great man, Tex Morton. Tex came out with a can of beer in his hand and um, he said, what's this? Been called away to a telephone call he's, and the guitar player's name was Peter. He said, here Peter, hold the telephone for me please. All the Martins and the Coys, they the breakfast mountain boys. And they carry on the few just as before. <laughs> Audiences were no longer interested in the old travelling country music shows. The stars now appeared nightly in their own homes. Tex, recognising the immediate and future role of television, had tried to put together his own Sydney-based country music television show. But he little knew the sorrow that he brought me when he handed me a letter edged in black. And I had been plugging away here with an idea for my own TV show, which uh, I hadn't been able to interest anyone uh, here in, in Australia at that time. In New Zealand, Tex hosted the popular live-to-air weekly New Zealand Broadcasting Commission television show, The Country Touch. And uh, the New Zealand uh, Broadcasting Commission were interested. We made a pilot, and the band on that first series we ever made were... This very good bluegrass band in New Zealand called the Hamilton County Bluegrass Band. Regular guests on that show, the Hamilton County Bluegrass Band, travelled to Australia with Tex Morton, and later recorded and toured with country legend Slim Dusty. And we'd go out and we'd go to the country towns and we'd pack them to the doors. And then I went down to Tasmania to open a new theatre. And I was absolutely amazed. We jam-packed the traffic. Well, the first time we met Tex was in uh, Tasmania. Um, I was in uh, Seven LA Launceston doing a country music program for Many Moons. And, of course, Tex came after his American uh, sojourn. He came back and wanted to get into the uh, touring again and did so. And uh, it, was, it was his tours of Tasmania that uh, we first came across him. We know it isn't money, he hasn't got a lot. Oh, I give many things to know what Robert D. Bump has got. A lifetime interest and hobby was as a licensed amateur ham radio operator. From all corners of the globe, he would broadcast to a legion of fans and friends. In 1970, he rang on the telephone and his voice was very clear. And I could actually hear my program in the background. And I assumed that he was ringing from somewhere fairly close. And we chatted on for quite some time. And then I asked him where he was. Tex said, I'm in New Zealand. I'm ringing from Auckland. I said, you can't be. I can hear the program. And he said, I have the biggest radio set in New Zealand and the biggest aerial in New Zealand. I can pick up any station anywhere. And uh, I still found it hard to believe, but that's true. As you may know, I'm an amateur radio enthusiast, and I've had my, my rig with me, my transmitter transceiver in the caravan for many years now in, in many countries. And you go to the caravan, and he'd put all this radio gear stuck all over the place. He was a mad radio ham. And I just have mates, and I say, how's the fishing up there? And <laughs> they say, hey, when you come up to, you know, to play that club, uh, just not too far from here, we'll, we'll arrange for... Uh, about and we'll combine business with pleasure and that's pretty much what I have been, have been doing. And I got the impression very early in the piece that he'd rather be um, twiddling the knobs of his worldwide radio receiver than actually singing in front of the crowd. <laughs> 
Tex Morton found success as the irritating but highly successful character voice for a series of advertisements voted the year's worst commercials. In recognition, Tex received a one-off Raw Prawn Award. In later years, we had a bit of a similar connection with uh, John Singleton. I used to write a few ads for John Singleton. In fact, True Blue came from the fact that he wanted a song about True Blue for his TV show. I used to do a lot of funny voices for various cartoon films, including Walt Disney, and make all the squeaky noises and do the various accents and all that sort of thing. And he used text for those where do you get it at? All those. Uh, where do you get it? It was actually Tex Morton, so here he was again, um, being the fellow that could, the jack of all trades in the business. And I, I think that's very Australian because, especially when it was a bit tough, the country music went through a very tough period. Rock and roll came in and took over, and I guess a lot of the, the old country showmen had to expand their activities a little bit, you know, and Tex was very good at that. The 70s arrived, and Tex, who is now approaching his 60s, had acquired status as the elder statesman of country music, recognised as an actor who had paid his dues in radio, on stage and in film. No, I've done quite a few, mostly, uh, you know, interstate stuff, uh, sell tractors, combines for a well-known uh, huge firm, singing jingle commercial. I did the one in New Zealand for the big throwaway disposable lighter. Hey, how about this? The new butane lighter from Bic. What's new about it is you don't have to mess around with refills. It'll last you about three months, and at this price, who cares if you lose it? Bic Flick. Lights first time, every time. Flick goes my lighter. Flick, Bic Flick. It's a great little lighter, and it's made by Bic. Shove it in your pocket. The new fire stick. And it never needs a refill. The new Bic Flick. And he had the ability, of course, he went on to be quite a, quite a good actor. Very versatile man. Based in Manly, Sydney, Tex was quick to see that the country music variety touring show's popularity had been lost to television. Morton began another adventure of his career, appearing on the popular television shows The Young Doctors, Matlock Police, Homicide, Waterloo Station and The Class of 75. He used to fascinate me because in many things he would do what he said he would do. He would be an actor, my son. <laughs> I will be an actor. And he was. I dabbled. I started doing a bit of acting. I, I took out my SAG, my Screen Actors Guild card, in Hollywood in 1950... something. 1949, yeah. So, uh, as Robert Morton. And I did a lot of bit character parts and so on. And I've lately started to do quite a bit of uh, Australian, uh, the Australian film industry, you know, is, is really booming. Gone a droving six or seven years ago, my rumbidgy jack by name. Things have never been the same in the boundary riding game. So I wander along. Robert Morton, actor, embraced and welcomed the resurgence of the Australian film industry, taking on the workload of a man half his age, appearing in more than eight feature movies, including F.J. Holden, Stir, Goodbye Paradise, and the critically acclaimed We of the Never Never. Sample, according to Telegram sent, eh? <laughs> the boys were expecting a real snorter. You know, 18 hands and all muscles. Are you John McLennan? No, no, I'm Ralph Williams. I run the Flavoured Hotel. Ah, in here, Scott. Oh, and my do? wife? How do you do? Oh, Max fixing up the horses. He, uh, he just got in from the Catherine. Looks like he could get some rain, eh? Uh, Tex Morton, 
obviously he was a man of quality, you know, like there are songs that are remembered and will be remembered for a long time. Back in the days when the competition was nowhere near as fierce, so, you know, he probably could have got away with maybe lesser quality songs, but he did have some great songs about the horse days. In 1973, at the age of 57, Tex achieved a crossover national number three hit with the song Gunda Windy Grey. And of course the Gunda Windy Grey was a was a hit all around Australia. You don't get that very much with country music. Gander Windy Grey, although not written by Tex, had his distinctive sound and remained in the charts for over 13 weeks. We cheered him from the grandstand and we cheered him from the flat. Cheered a little beauty, a real aristocrat. He's never thrown the towel in, been a trier all the way. A horse from Gander Windy, the Gander Windy Grey. And I think, I think he's rightfully earned, earned the, uh, the mantle of father. I mean, obviously he was the first one that, that really made Australians realise there is such a thing as, as country music. Even though he came from New Zealand, you know, I think it was... Uh, he came out here and developed his style here and uh, he, brought it, he brought it to the fore. And I, and I guess uh, there was no one really between him and Banjo Patterson. Just a little wiser now, I guess I'm growing old Believing only what I see and half of what I'm told I look into the future as far as I can see More and more I think about the way it used to be Ignored by the establishment, the achievements of Tex Morton were finally to be acknowledged and recognised by his peers. He had single-handedly pioneered the beginnings of the Australian and New Zealand country music industry, unveiling a plaque in his own honour at the first Tamworth Roll of Renown ceremony. In January 1976, when the first of these plaques went onto this rock, the plaque of Tex Morton, it was rather an interesting day. He, I'm not quite sure whether the word was embarrassed, but he certainly was humble, he certainly was a little concerned about the fuss that was being paid to him. But the interesting thing was that he was very touched. Well, Tex was a bit of a villain when it came to, to being appreciated. He went through most of his career receiving very little appreciation because there wasn't the media, there weren't the newspaper stories. His main appreciation came from the fans. And I think he was, in fact I know, he was very touched by the fact that a whole bunch, it was a very big crowd of people that came out here that day to see the first plaque go on this rock. And I think that probably was one of the big moments of his life. The next day, he was out at uh, 2 TM having a look at the Royal Renown. It was well into the evening and he had his big Dodge car parked halfway on the lawn and halfway on the road near where he had elevated his uh, Royal Renown plaque up on the big rocks out there. And Tex was walking across and he had a great big torch and he was shining this torch around to have a look at his um, plaque there. So I walk up and says to uh, Tex, um, hello Tex, what are you up to? He said, I'm trying to have a look at this. They gave it to me yesterday and they took the bastard away. The following year, the hands that had created the sound of Australian country music would forever be immortalised in a slush of cement, sand and water, while a crowd of enthusiastic fans witnessed a chapter of country music history unfolding in the small country town of Tamworth, New South Wales, the country music capital of Australia. Well, I'm glad to see it happen. It was, it's a wonderful gesture. And I think those, uh, those involved uh, ought to be congratulated. Not because I'm a participant, I don't mean that, but I think it's very nice for country folk to be able to come here and, and see uh, what, what goes on in Tamworth, the hub of country western music in Australia, the Nashville of Australia, I think they use something. The star that had blazed across the night sky in New Zealand's sleepy coastal town of Nelson in 1916 was to appear again over Sydney on the 23rd of July 1983, this time to collect and guide the spirit of the man who had touched the stars, leaving behind a trail that would forever light the night skies. Tex Morton's star had shone brighter than any constellation. 
Yes, one has to remember the day Tex Morton died because it became a, a day in history that we certainly weren't expecting. It was a day in history that we certainly weren't wanting. I'll never be ready, the star loudly cried. Well, I shouldn't worry, someone replied, for if you're not ready, <laughs> you can pack up and get. The show will go on just the same, never fret. And there's another fellow waiting to take your place, and he knows every line, every move on your face. The news of the passing of the 67-year-old pioneer of country in St. Vincent's Hospital, Sydney, with his wife, Kath, and Lane family at his bedside, spread across Australia, New Zealand, and beyond. Fans and friends relived the stories, the memories, and shared the passing of an era of Australian country music, the last ride of Tex Morton. Tex Morton, and at 20 past three yesterday afternoon, that great Australian voice was stilled forever. Tex was 67, and he was admitted to uh, the Royal North Shore's intensive care unit in Sydney uh, last Monday, suffering from pneumonia, and he died yesterday afternoon. And I remember driving out of the motel and uh, turning the ABC radio on and uh, heard that the great uh, legend in Australian country music passed away today. Tex Morton. And the news just spread like wildfire. It was unbelievable. You just couldn't accept it. I, I, you know, I think everybody was, was really stunned when he passed away. Well, I was rather astounded. I mean, you don't think that uh, a man like Tex is ever going to die, let alone die at a comparatively young age. I, I, I believe that it, it, it would have been Nick Irby's show that I, where I heard Tex Morton had died. And it was quite a shock. I remember it. I was asleep at the time because I was working midnights on Radio 2 Yui in Sydney when Kevin Knapp from 2TM rang me to tell me that Tex had passed away. I did hear he was very he had cold or something which led to pneumonia or pleurisy, so, but that's the way I heard how he passed away. It was very quick. I knew he was sick. Tex knew he was sick. He knew himself, but he didn't know it was uh, terminal. And uh, they said it was pneumonia, but it was lung cancer that killed Tex, not pneumonia. Um, OK, he smoked and he lived life hard and all that sort of stuff, but um, you think, well, he is almost immortal. You, you don't expect, uh, what was he, 60-something or other? You don't expect a, a man uh, of his strength, not only of character but body, um, to succumb to a disease at that age. But just when you've made a big start, you might suddenly be called to depart. But the world will go on just the same. Never fret. Your absence, in fact, may break nobody's heart. And uh, I was on the road in 83 promoting the Slim Dusty movie. And uh, some of the show people said, you know, Tex has passed away suddenly. And it wasn't publicised very much in 83, and, uh, and that was it. it. There was no, no big publicity about it at all. But I reckon he could have wanted that way, to be silent all of a sudden he's passed on. He may have wanted to, to go out silently, you know, instead of a big fuss, or everyone calling at the hospital was sending cards, to, like goes on now, you know. But he may have wanted it that way. There was a show that night, in memory of Tex Morton, a lot of the artists got up at Tamworth Town Hall, uh, Tamworth Workers Club, sorry, and each of them sang a Tex Morton song, and it was one of the most moving uh, shows that I have ever seen. It was so spontaneous. The sad news filtered through to me that uh, Tex had passed away. Um, that hit us like a ton of bricks, actually. We, uh, we all did a tribute that night on the show to Tex, and I did a few of his old songs. That, that night, every song or song you would be thinking of Tex. Yes, Tex was a wonderful entertainer and a sh real showman. I'm uh, grateful to have known him and have worked with him just the bit that I did. He was a great man, missed, and never ever will that man ever be replaced. Tex Morton. The old world will go on just the same. Never fret. And your absence, in fact, may break nobody's heart. Now you die. And you go to, well, it matters not where, 
For a thoroughbred here is a thoroughbred there. And there are some who are born pound foolish, and some penny wise. But six feet of earth makes us all the same size. Yes, you may feel important. You may feel important down here while you exist. But after you're gone, you'll never be missed. Old Baldy here, he's, he's getting kind of restless like, and I guess the old covered wagon's got to be on its way. So, so long for the present, friends, but we'll be back again mighty soon with some more of the good old tunes from the West. Anyhow, so long, folks. We'll be seeing y'all again. So long. <laughs> Gala mine, roll along, covered wagon, roll along. 